listening to the Carleton Political Science Podcast, brought to you by the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I'm Asif Me, one of the PhD students with the program. Later this year, American President Donald Trump will make his first bid for re-election against a currently unknown Democratic candidate. And in many ways, the race to find that candidate has stirred just as much intrigue as the campaign road ahead. Over the past few months, the playing field of over 20 potential nominees has whittled down to just a select few, with each offering a different vision of what the party should look like moving forward. In many ways, these diverging views also result in a very different vision of public policy, not the least of which includes a policy area heavily impacted by President Trump's America First vision, and that's foreign policy. How does Joe Biden's vision of America's place in the world differ from Bernie Sanders, or Elizabeth Warren's for that matter? To answer these questions, I spoke with Aaron Edinger, a professor here at Carleton's Department of Political Science, specializing in American foreign policy. Just a special note, this episode was recorded the morning Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the race, so our conversation omits that turn of events. However, it still seeks to address her differing views on a progressive American foreign policy versus Bernie Sanders' leftist foreign policy versus that of Joe Biden's more traditional view of democratic foreign policy. So probably the most salient thing in politics over the past few years has been the controversial tenure of Donald Trump as president of the United States. I mean, we've seen in its wake a fundamental shift in America's place in the globe and a great deal of social fragmentation, not just America, but abroad, really, as a result of that presidency. It comes as no surprise this being an election year in the U.S., all eyes are kind of on the lead up to November. What do you think about this current moment in American politics? Well, it's very, very interesting because we are sort of, I mean, sort of on the on the on the precipice of, of a pretty significant shift away from you know the post Cold War paradigm in American politics towards something different. Right, 2016 really seems like, like like a breaking point where, you know, the 90s and the 2000s, there was tremendous tolerance for open markets, free markets, free trade, overseas adventurism. Uh, now, you know, with the rise of Donald Trump and the kind of populist pushbacks you see on the left and the right wing, 2016 comes across as this really kind of crux moment over the past 30 years where things are looking different. Now that we're in the midst of the Democratic primaries, we're really getting to see how the left-wing side of the American political spectrum is responding to the right-wing insurgency. And on the left, or I should say the liberal to socialist left of the Democratic Party, you're seeing real intellectual diversity across the spectrum there. And I think it's really sort of encouraging as, you know, as, as an affirmation of how many new ideas exist out there in the marketplace for ideas as a, uh, as a counterpoint to the Donald Trump insurgency. So here we are in 2020 now. My goodness, it's 2020. Hard to believe. I know. <laughs> and, you know, politics is really, really interesting, not only for the kind of day-to-day electoral combat, but there really is, uh, you know, a battle of ideas out there, right? America first, uh, which is in of itself a very interesting set of ideas against this new sort of leftism in the Democratic Party. And it's really interesting because for the Democrats, you're, you're coming off this four years of unprecedented division in American society. And really, it should be a pretty easy go. Like, it's the sort of thing like, you know, you could put the ficus in, the ficus would probably win the election. Yet the Democrats kind of, they don't have the unity that one would hope. And it stems a lot from like that diversity of ideas that you were talking about that are really at the heart of the sort of leadership versus the grassroots in the party. But what are your thoughts on the current state of where the Democratic Party are at right now? You know, the, the, you know, the Democratic primary moment right now seems, you know, unbearably chaotic, but it's sort of of a piece with all of the previous Democratic primaries over the last 15 or 20 years or so, at least at least since Al Gore, who was more or less, you know, going to be the nominee after the su- success of the Clinton years. You know, in 2004, it seems now that John Kerry was the inevitable candidate, but, you know, he still had to go through a pretty rough primary that involved as many as like 10 or 15 candidates at one point, right? Nothing was inevitable about Barack Obama in 2008, right? It seemed like Hillary Clinton was going to be the inevitable candidate, uh, but, you know, Barack Obama ultimately made his way through. Uh, 
it was in the 2016 primaries with the Bernie Sanders movement that the Democratic primary started getting really particularly contentious on a, on a fundamental level because there was this anti-establishment figure who led a movement of very, very enthusiastic supporters and of, of, of a substantial number pushing back against the establishment, right? And that establishment versus anti-establishment dynamic is much different than just a simple diversity of ideas on the stage, right? So we all know what happened in 2016, and we're seeing in 2020 the same kind of establishment versus anti-establishment dynamic. It is contentious, yes, as it has been contentious since, say, let's say, 2004. So in that regard, there's not a whole lot of difference. However, it is the, you know, the, the, ver- the voraciousness of this Sanders insurgency that makes the primaries on the Democratic side of things today considerably different. It's interesting because we're just coming off Super Tuesday. And really, the past couple, of, you could take the past two weeks even, and just look at the volatility. We've seen people drop out. We've seen Sanders make gains. Then this past week, Biden seems to be back to being the front runner. And really, we, we're currently standing with three front runners: and Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, each of them have very different visions for the party, not just in terms of domestic policy, but in terms of what you're interested in, which is foreign policy. What are the three different visions that they represent? Yeah. So you know, s- the simple headline slogans here. Uh, is this. Joe Biden is basically running on Obama part two, right? He is going to revive the Obama presidency and do an Obama foreign policy and everything's going to be hunky-dory, right? No malarkey. Elizabeth Warren and uh, Bernie Sanders are much more interesting and quite different from Democratic candidates of the past. Of course, Bernie Sanders is of the Democratic Socialist wing of the Democratic Party. He's not a Democratic Party member, sits as an independent, but he leads that social democratic side of things. And his worldview is really interesting, right? He sees uh, the world shaping up as being a contest between authoritarianism, autocracy, and kleptocracy against democracy, egalitarianism, and equality. So this big kind of binary Manichaean worldview sort of resembles, you know, Harry Truman talking about the Soviet Union versus the free world way, way back in the 1950s. And this this intellectual construct is really interesting because it's quite different than the Biden-Obama era of America leading an international order, or George W. Bush, democracy promotion and ending tyranny, or Bill Clinton expanding the post-Cold War liberal order. That binary push of authoritarianism and inequality versus democracy and equality is really quite striking. Elizabeth Warren is of a similar cut from a similar cloth. Her progressive internationalism also takes up that binary view of things, uh, but scales it back a little bit, right? She's much more interested in the kind of technical aspects of what government can do in order to revive America's place in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting that you mentioned the sort of progressive internationalism that they represent, because really America is the, the, the home of liberal internationalism, like since going back to the post-war period where we're talking about democracy, liberalism, good governance being the sort of order that they promoted as being kind of the hegemon in the world. What would a progressive foreign policy look like to basically the home of liberal foreign policy? Great question. Um, I think what a progressive foreign policy would look like depends on whether it's a Warren foreign policy or a Sanders foreign policy. So they both have that worldview that, you know, that the oligarchs and the tyrants and the autocrats are all on the same side and they're conspiring against democracy and equality and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, a leftist foreign policy, like, you know, a Bernie Sanders foreign policy would be one that would reinvest heavily on sort of the domestic foundations of, of American power, the kind of, the kind of domestic spending, welfare state spending that uh, we're much more familiar with coming out of Bernie, Bernie Sanders. But what you would also see, and this is, kind of, this is quite significant in, in a Sanders foreign policy, is a foreign policy of restraint. 
right, of, quote, ending the endless wars, which has become a popular slogan among the Democratic candidates. Right? He is very, very adamant about scaling back the degree of American military interventionism, which has characterized the last 30 years. Right? It's, it's, it's quite enormous. There's been something like 70 different countries that the United States has intervened in militarily since the end of the Cold War. So this foreign policy of restraint you know, from a Bernie Sanders presidency would also see considerable cuts in defense spending, Right, in order to you know starve the military of the wherewithal to go out and do the kinds of things it's been doing for the last thirty years, it would re-enable Congress to do its constitutional oversight of foreign policy, and especially of war making. It would involve rescinding the post nine eleven authorizations for the use of military force, which has basically been blank checks to the president to wage wars far and wide with no geographical or time limitations. So in that regard, this is quite a revolutionary change in what we've seen, certainly since 9-11 under a Bernie Sanders presidency. Sanders is also, of course, about economic equality and egalitarianism, and he is no fan of free trade. And he's made that pretty clear in his foreign policy statements. Uh, Elizabeth Warren's foreign policy really picks up most significantly on that free trade issue. Her kind of progressive internationalism is one that involves, you know, a, a global America. Right? She's by no means an isolationist, but she does have a streak of nationalism in her, economic nationalism in her. She doesn't call it economic nationalism. You go to her website, go to her blogs, she calls it economic patriotism. Right? And economic patriotism is, is more than just a slogan. I think this is really interesting. Her program for revitalized trade relations is one that sets access to the American market really high. Right? If you want to enter into a trade agreement with the United States, if you want to do business with the United States, if you want your country's products getting into the United States, you have to raise your regulatory standards at home to meet you know, the, at least the regulatory standard that exists in the United States. And of course, a Warren presidency would see regulatory standards rise in the United States. It is essentially a race to the top. Right? If you've taken a political science class over the last 25 years, you've heard all about the race to the bottom, right? where in this neoliberal age, the United States and the World Trade Organization and the IMF all promoted deregulation. Right? This is sort of a re-regulation, right? And the United States would use its bargaining leverage to not deregulate other countries, but to make them uh, enact regulation that is pro-climate, pro-labor, pro-women, uh, something that would meet the, a real progressive agenda. That is... I think, at the heart of an Elizabeth Warren foreign policy. Now, she also embraces the ending of the endless wars, scaling back on the military, industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera. But it is that really kind of deep government, technical uh, uh, manipulation of the regulatory environment that would characterize an Elizabeth Warren foreign policy. Well, it's fascinating to me because both of these represent like a push away from two very strong structures in American governance that you outlined there. One is militarism, because I mean, that is an embedded structure in all aspects of policymaking, let alone American political culture, right? You know, the idea that you support the military, it's a fundamental part of American political identity. And then, you know, that sort of deregulatory neoliberal mindset, these are the polar opposite very much of significant parts of American political culture. How would that go over, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, don't th I don't think there is as wide an appetite in 2020 for uh, military adventurism as there was 5, 10, 15 years ago. I certainly, you know, let's, let's you know, cast your mind back to 2002, 2003 and the run-up to the Iraq War. Right? The United States population was fairly split on going to war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq. But at the same time, there was no huge blowback when in March 2003 the invasion began and most people more or less aligned behind the troops, if not the project. I think the 2011 intervention in Libya really soured Americans on humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect. And now in 2016, then 2020, the appetite for widespread military adventurism 
is 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 gone. Just last week, the Trump administration signed a, a you know a memorandum of understanding with the Taliban to get out of Afghanistan. I think that's the right thing to do because you can't stay in Afghanistan forever. But the idea of sitting down and negotiating with you know people who planted roadside bombs and blew the legs off of thousands of American soldiers over the last twenty years. Is is and it's it's remarkable that there was it barely made a blip in the American body politic, right? I, and I think this is symptomatic of a desire to scale back the kinds of military commitments that we that we've grown accustomed to over the past thirty years. I can't help but think of when Jack Layton said we should negotiate with the Taliban. He was just labeled Taliban Jack. Yeah, they called him <laughs> Taliban Jack, and you know what? You know, Jack Layton, 10 or 11 years ago when he said that, was was right. You got to be able to negotiate with the enemy in order to end the war. So as you said, Bernie Sanders is really purporting a, a foreign policy discourse, which is based on socialism and the left. What does leftist internationalism look like? This is really interesting because a left-wing internationalism and a left-wing foreign policy are two separate things. Right, back in the late 19th century and definitely into the 1950s and the 1960s, left-wing internationalism didn't really have a whole lot of purchase within the halls of power. So left internationalism was all about you know, anti-imperialism, anti-war, anti-oppression. A lot of times it was about anti-Americanism, certainly in the 1960s. Throughout the 90s, it was about anti-globalization, anti-inequality. Now it's about climate change, action. But these are kind of mass movements about sentiments. And however valid these arguments may be, it's very hard to operationalize those things in a functioning foreign policy. So, you know, what does a left-wing foreign policy look like for the United States? And I, and I think it has about five distinctive components. Right, the first one is about a kind of a conceptual rejection of foreign policy and domestic policy, right? The two exist on a continuum. And it, you know, a basic principle of leftism is that moral commitments to people beyond your borders are just as important as moral commitments to your own political community, right? With regards to equality, about welfare, about social justice and solidarity, right? So in that regard, an American left-wing foreign policy would be one that is deeply committed to uh, refugees, to my migrants, to the victims of climate change. You know, a second component of a left-wing foreign policy is an embrace of the architecture of the liberal international order. Now, it seems kind of counterintuitive here, because why would a leftist want to you know, stick with the liberal toolkit? Well, fundamentally, you have this really, really complex and integrated three-quarter of a century old architecture of world politics that can be moved in a left-wing direction by an American foreign policy. Bernie Sanders is particularly taken with the United Nations General Assembly and wants to do politics through the UN General Assembly. Third plank is kind of old-school anti-authoritarianism, right? Eugene Debs, right? Stokely Carmichael, they hated the, you know, the colonial oppressors, all that kind of stuff back in the day. Anti-authoritarianism takes on a different character in 2020 with the rise of the new authoritarians across around the world. And a, an American left-wing foreign policy would make common cause with both, both leftist groups and right-wing groups that happen to be pro-democracy. So you could see those kinds of things emerging with a left-wing foreign policy. A fourth plank is anti-militarism, right? End the endless wars, scale back on the military-industrial complex. But you know, a left-wing foreign policy would have to contend with the question of solidarity and military intervention. What do you do when the responsibility to protect kicks in? Right? Would a left-wing foreign policy president do humanitarian intervention? Or would you know, they leave the Rohingya or the Benghazi rebels or the Uyghurs in northwest China to their own demise? As an unresolved question on the left there. And the final plank is probably the, the most commonly understood one, which is about economic justice and social democracy, right? You live a just economic life at home and you export it overseas. 
and you subordinate the interests of capital to the interests of society. Right? That's straight out of the left-wing playbook. It can be projected in foreign policy terms by renegotiating, recasting trade relations to suit the interests of society and not just capital. Right? You could see this through any number of renegotiations of trade agreements and so on and so forth. Those are the sort of five planks of a left-wing foreign policy. Well, it's interesting because, like, as you said, it's very much married to aspects of the liberal order, or liberal foreign policy, I should say. It's just much more normative in a way. Yeah, it is. I mean, a left-wing foreign policy is very, very normative. It's deeply embedded in a very long history of intellectual thought about what is ethical and what is just in war, what is just in economic relations, which is a good thing, right? Now, there is no kind of foreign policy playbook for the left, but there is a very, very long history of left-wing political movements, left-wing political thought. We just haven't heard much about it in mainstream political science and, and political discourse in the United States or even in Canada for about 30 years. Right? It seemed like the collapse of the Soviet Union kind of did away with all of that lefty stuff from the middle part of the 20th century. But you know what? The ideas still have tremendous resonance and can be mobilized and updated for the year 2020. Well, it's interesting because much of what the Trump administration rallied against, both in 2016 and really over the course of his presidency, are, are the kind of ideas at the heart of his brand of uh, internationalism. You know, cosmopolitanism, uh, interdependency, multilateralism. And there's a large contingent of the population in the states that, you know, adheres to that mentality, particularly as it relates to foreign policy. Especially with Bernie's particular brand, which we can kind of call leftist internationalism, and you have in the past. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think this can find footing with the American voting populace? Yes. These ideas are not entirely foreign to the United States at all, right? There is a streak of anti-militarism, anti pacifism, economic nationalism that runs throughout the, the American you know, political culture. It just seems like things like nationalism have been captured and appropriated by the America First agenda, right? But things like you know putting protections and re-regulating the economy are things that Americans, at least some Americans, are sympathetic to if it works, right? You know, the Americans are not necessarily fully ideological at all times, right? Show me what it can do, and then perhaps I'll accept it. So, I, you know, a, you know, a left internationalism, a progressive internationalism may catch on, you know, if these programs pay dividends. And I can't help but think some, but uh, climate change being kind of the large issue, mm -hmm. which is taking over the political imagination in nearly every state across the world. And that really requires this sort of approach. And the American first approach yeah, it was kind of the polar opposite of that. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, and on the climate change file, the Republicans have basically vacated the field, right? And they've left it to the, you know, the deniers or the skeptics or the indifferent nature of their, you know, their supporters or their elites, right? On the Democratic side of things, climate change is front and center. Right? Alongside authoritarianism and ending the endless wars, Playing a leading role in climate change governance is top of mind for Biden, Sanders, and Warren. I really don't think there's a whole lot of disagreement between those three on that file. Tricky thing is is actually meeting you know targets for 2030 and 2050. Uh, I know that Bernie Sanders has signed on to the Green New Deal, which would be a radical reformulation of the domestic political economy in the United States in order to meet those objectives. I don't think the American people are that radical, and I don't necessarily think a program as expensive as that one will fly. But it shows you the degree to which the democratic side of the spectrum has embraced climate change and climate change action and governance as something that is core to its political program. It's interesting, though, because like the global liberal order if there ever was one, right? A lot has changed over the past few years, and even the most conservative approach to foreign policy amongst the Democratic frontrunners would essentially try and get things back to the way they used to be, you know, if not fundamentally change it. 
Do you think that's even possible after four years of America First? No, and it's not just because of four years of America First, right? Fundamentally, the world has changed over the last, let's say, 10 years, right? The vaunted liberal international order may have existed for a period of maybe 10 or 15 years after the end of the Cold War, when the United States and its program of liberalism and democracy and open markets and near perfect security was more or less unchallenged, right? Yeah, there was 9-11, but that wasn't, you know, an existential threat to the United States or to American prosperity. Right. So over the last 15 years, and I'm going to mark the time and date of this, this was the opening ceremonies of the Beijing Olympics in 2008, when the next big thing in world politics announced its arrival. Right? And the rise of China and its economic might and its military capabilities and its diplomatic heft in East Asia and Central Asia and even into Africa represents a significant change to the boundary conditions of what is possible in American grand strategy. Of course, Russia's resurgence, certainly after 2014 with its shenanigans in Ukraine, represents another significant challenge to the American-led order. So, you know, we can't return to a past before 2014 or before 2008, right? The global conditions have changed. At the same time, of course, there are the domestic conditions of uh, American foreign policy, where the attitudes and the tolerance levels among the American people for foreign poly policy experimentation is pretty much gone. And I think we are in, you know, now in the post post Cold War era of American foreign policy. Finally, I guess for the last question, I'm going to ask you to put your predictive cap on. You know, given the state of the primaries and the campaign trail ahead, what do you think the likelihood of even elements of the discourses of this sort of internationalism we've been talking about today, what do you think the likelihood is of some of that getting or becoming the new regime of American foreign policy? Low. Uh, I think it's going to be low because you can't turn around a 75-year-old program of liberal internationalism on a dime. And you know who proved that? Donald Trump. Right? America, you could thunder about America first, America first. But you know what? There are thousands and thousands of people working in the foreign policy establishment, in government, in big business, in, I'm going to include academia in here as the, you know, the most influential of all the actors in the foreign policy establishment. Of course, absolutely. No. But there's tremendous resistance to his America first nationalism. Right? And you see people at different places throughout the foreign policy establishment pushing back or trying to slow down his nationalist uh, grand strategy. I think a left internationalist or a progressive internationalist or even like a soft leftist internationalist, you know, a liberal internationalist like Joe Biden would face similar kinds of uh, resistance from various lobby groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the United States government is not built for rapid change. So, you know, we can go on and on about the prospects of a foreign policy of the left emerging in the United States. Fundamentally, you would have to contend with the, you know, tremendous amount of friction built into the American political system. So, interestingly enough, the last time we did an episode together, I you know, asked you what was on the pipeline, and it was very much this stuff. So yeah. what's going on in your research right now? What have you been up to? Well, since we talked about uh, sports and politics, and I teased that left-wing foreign policy question, I, uh, I put together uh, an article call asking, is there an emerging left-wing foreign policy in the United States? I think we talked about that originally back in the fall, uh, this Article should be published in the International Journal coming up, I think, in March. And I am happy to say that uh, the primary season has not proven me completely wrong, <laughs> right? Which is always very good. You know, as an academic, if you're writing something about current events, you risk immediate obsolescence. I think what we have seen out of the primary season is a very interesting affirmation of a lot of the ideas, not just mine 
about left-wing internationalism that have been kind of in the discourse for a number of years, if you pay attention to you know, left-wing intellectualism in the United States. As always, thank you again for joining us. This was really, really informative. Looking forward to when the article comes out. And make sure to let us know. And we'll, we'll put it out there for you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at CU underscore poli sci, on Instagram at CU underscore poli dot sci, and on Facebook at carltonu.polysci.